I V M. Yuddha is for adults. It contains graphic depictions of violence against humans and animals. If you feel you'll be triggered by the accounts of violence in this podcast, it's best you skip through those bits. That said, on to the episode. A sea of 20,000 fighting men tramples through farms and tracks across the plains of India. The figure leading them is a superbly fit 43-year-old man, the Padshah of Kabul, the man known as Zahiruddin Muhammad or simply Babur. Mounted on his horse and looking across the horizon, he does not know what destiny will bring him. Can his ambitious plan really work? He only knows that the die is cast. He would later write, After dispatching my light troops against Ghazi Khan, I put my foot in the stirrup of resolution, set my hand on the rein of trust in God, and moved forward against Sultan Ibrahim, son of Behlul Lodi Afghan, in possession of whose throne at that time were the Delhi capital and the dominions of Hindustan, and whose standing army was one lakh strong, and whose own elephants and whose big elephants were about one thousand. The hand that holds the reins of Babur's horse has royal blood flowing through its veins. Babur is the great great grandson of Timur, the warlord that had bloodily swept across the plains and massacred the inhabitants of Delhi more than 100 years earlier. From his mother's side, Babur is a direct descendant of Chinggis Khan. This descendant of conquerors is also a man of refinement who writes poetry and prose and openly admits to weeping for the loss of his beloved Samarkand. Yet, like Timur, Babur is also a ruthless and highly capable warlord. His army may be small, but it wields the latest in firearms technology and seeks glory on the battlefield. Babur may not know it yet, but the feats that they accomplish will transform the fortunes of his family. Far more importantly, they will shape India's destiny and change the course of world history. But first, Babur must go to war. Hello everyone and welcome back to Yuddha. Before we begin season 2, we want to thank you all for your warmth and for your good wishes, for the questions that you've asked us, for the points that you've raised. We've learned a lot from them. We've been inspired by your support. And in this season we want to take Yuddha further. We want to make it even better. We want to make it more interesting. And we're hoping once again that Yuddha will help us understand our own past better. One thing we'll be trying to do this season is have shorter and sharper episodes that are focused on something specific and hopefully this helps you engage better and it hopes and we hope it gets other people also interested in Yuddha. One thing that Anirudh and I have always focused on in Yuddha is to understand warfare and war in all their aspects the term military history is often misleading because it seems to suggest that it's all about a specific military activity but in fact militaries are products of the societies in which they are created and in turn they shape those societies they shape polities warfare itself is a not just a political activity it's also a social and a cultural activity and i hope that in the last season of yuddha we gave you some sense of this as we come closer to our times we'll have more evidence to tease out these details to understand the relationship between war and society and culture and use the prism of military history to understand our past better this is especially important because military history is often misunderstood it is often thought of as a series of tales of daring do or a series of catastrophes it is uh, thought to be narrowly interested in purely operational matters now of course all those things do concern us and we will be covering them and we love to cover them but we will place them in the broader context of politics of society of culture of economy and of geopolitics meaning the relationship between geography and history so welcome back to yudha and we really hope that you are going to enjoy this season as much as we are going to enjoy making it for you all So in the last season of Yuddha we brought things to a close by talking about this extraordinary military revolution that erupted in the early modern Deccan um due to the arms race in a sense between Vijayanagara and the Deccan Sultanates 
the fact that warfare is both a cultural and a social activity, and that also involves all these other separate strands of politics, of culture, of the movements of people, and most importantly of geopolitics, uh, were all things that we have seen in the conflict of Vijayanagara and the Deccan Sultanates. For example, we saw how both Vijayanagara and the Deccan Sultanates really struggled to attract talent from the broader Persian world. We saw them innovating in the runs of gunpowder and in terms of the usage of cavalry. And we saw that to a great extent, the events that led up to the Battle of Talikota were fundamentally driven by personal politics as much as they were driven by geopolitics and the conflict of the Raichur Dawab. We said earlier in season one that the great eruptions of the Central Asian peoples, of the Turks and the Mongols specifically, had come to a close roughly by the early 14th century. But something absolutely horrifying began in the late 14th century with the emergence of an amazing and really extraordinary new Central Asian warlord, a guy called Timur, also known in the West as Tamerlane. Timur was the last of the great Central Asian conquerors, and he profoundly impacted and transformed uh, the geopolitics of West and Central Asia. But his activities in India also would have a very, very profound political and cultural impact um, and would lead rather directly to the later campaigns of his descendant, Nababur, whom we saw in the beginning of this episode. Now, what are we going to be doing over most of this season? Though in most of last season, we focus a lot on the Deccan and southern India. This season is really going to start with northern India. We're going to see how the Gangetic Plains and their periphery were transformed by the activities of these remarkable and highly contentious descendants of Babur, who are known today in India as the Mughals, but during their own time, generally refer to themselves as the Gurkhanis, referring to their Timurid heritage, which is something that we'll come back to. So after a few episodes exploring the Mughals and the innovations they introduced into northern India and the various adversaries and rivals who they overcame in their journey, uh, we will return once again to the Deccan. We will see the rise of some really remarkable tactics, especially under the remarkable commander Malik Ambar and later on his successors, including, of course, the famous Maratha ruler Shivaji. But I don't want to spoil too much of the season for you. So let's take a step back and let's actually begin by talking about the career of this last great warlord. Aditya, tell us about Timur. Thanks, Hanirud. Like you had mentioned, Timur or Timur A. Link was the great great grandfather of Babur. And uh, his identity is complicated and fascinating. The Timurids were Barlas. Barlas were people who were ethnically largely Mongol, but were in aspects of their culture highly Turkic and were also people who embraced Persian culture. So think about this. This is a time when the Mongol Empire has largely fragmented. And yet, there remain powerful regional Mongol successor states. And in the middle of Transaxonia, you have this small kingdom really suddenly expand under the tutelage of uh, this man, Timur. They come from a very cosmopolitan world. They're still very much at the crossroads of various civilizations. There are ideas coursing through these regions, goods, and there are technologies. And at the same time, Timur and his successors are also products of the Central Asian way of war. They are very adept at using cavalry, both light and heavy, heavy cavalry, to overwhelm their enemies. And the manner of warfare that they wage uh, continues to be something that is really formidable for settled peoples. I should mention over here that Timur and his kingdom themselves are somewhere in that transition zone between a nomadic empire and settled peoples. They embrace a lot of the culture and the ideas and modes of living of settled peoples while retaining much about their nomadic heritage as well. You know, it's, it's a really interesting little kingdom. Now, by the year 1398, Timur and his family had already expanded their power quite a bit in West Asia. And it was in 1398 that one of his grandsons decided, well, it's time to uh, make a little incursion into India. And he went down the Indus River Valley and besieged the city of Uch. And uh, pretty soon he found himself stuck there. He was not able to basically prosecute the siege. And uh, so it was time for his granddaddy to come into the picture. And so in March of 1398, Timur brings a large army, perhaps as many as 90,000 men, not just to relieve Pir Muhammad, but also to conduct a larger show of force in India and hopefully uh, make off with a large load of loot. Of course, to justify this, Timur and his uh, followers in post facto talk about how they're there to fight infidels and so on. Their actions are quite at odds with that stated motive. So Timur's army leaves Samarkand in 1398 March. And he's pretty soon cutting this bloody sway through Afghanistan. 
He joins his grandson by September. They help complete the siege and then they move east towards Delhi. Once again, this march eastwards into the plains of the Yamuna, once again, marked by massacres, by sieges and so on. They land up not far from Delhi and immediately, this is a time when, you know, we must recall that the Delhi Sultanate is a complete shadow of what it was. If you recall what we talked about in the previous season, what was the Delhi Sultanate had fragmented into several smaller sultanates, the most magnificent of which were, of course, the Deccani Sultanates. And by the late 14th century, the Tughlaq dynasty uh, ruling Delhi sees its own fief contracting. You know, what was once this proud empire that actually dominated a huge chunk of the Indian subcontinent has now reduced down to a little area around Delhi and its environs. You know, there's the old uh, couplet or doggerel that says, Az Dili to Palam, Padshai Shah Alam, meaning from Delhi to Palam is the realm of the ruler of the world. You know, it's it's one of those clever and cruel little ditties that I think summarizes the state of the Sultanate at this time. So you have this tiny little Sultanate hmm. and they're facing perhaps one of the most formidable armies in the world, that of Timur. And it's amazing that despite having a weak ruler in Sultan Mahmud, despite having fewer resources, despite having a small and not very well organized army, uh, the Delhi Sultanate does respond militarily. The first thing that happens is they send out a harassing raid. And unfortunately, what that results in is a massacre. By this time, Timur's army has amassed perhaps as many as 50,000 civilian captives. And as soon as these captives see a small cavalry force coming and harassing Timur's army, they get jubilant. And uh, Timur gets really freaked out by this and he orders a massacre of all of these people. So you can already see what lies in store for Delhi in the days ahead. Timur and his army set up on a hill facing the city of Delhi. The city of Delhi was restricted to much of what is today South Delhi. The hill on which uh, they were camped is, of course, what we now call the ridge in Delhi. And they had a flat plain in between. And this is where Timur arrayed his army. It's really interesting to see how they did this. They did not just amass on the plain, but uh, we know from sources that Timur and his army built ditches, they used trees and hedges and so on to build field fortifications of various sorts to protect their flanks. And another really interesting thing that they did at their center was to bring these large herds of camels and buffaloes and essentially tie them up together with strong strips of either oxide or leather. And I'd bring these up because you might start hearing about something similar in the episodes to come. And so basically, Timur has a defensive position in the flat plains just outside Delhi. And he has a larger army, a better army, a more capable army. And uh, the Delhi Sultanate makes the mistake of attacking him. They push back the Sultanate's forces. They attack the Sultanate's forces from the sides and eventually defeat it. The Sultanate's forces are pushed back to uh, what is today Hoskas and then eventually uh, flee and are broken apart. Now, eventually the city of Delhi gives up. Timur, it seems to be ready to leave the city in peace. But apparently we hear there's an uprising in the city and that ends in a terrible massacre of almost all the inhabitants of the city. The city is turned into basically a pile of ruins. There's almost no one left alive. And uh, with this massacre done, Timur, you know, mucks around the plains for a bit and heads back uh, all the way to Samarkand. He, ha he carries with him not just massive loot from Delhi, but he's also among the survivors of the city, found artisans, architects, artists he's, that he's going to take back to work as, as part of the spoils of his victory to basically build more grand buildings in his capital city of Samarkand. This, this, I mean, how do you even like comprehend 50,000 lives just being slaughtered because a warlord is annoyed or <laughs> freaked out or whatever? And more importantly, we're talking about the, the destruction of a city. Like, you, you have to think, right? We've been in one of the major locations where we spent a lot of time in, in the last season was Delhi. Um, we talked about how these fortifications were put up. We talked about um, the lives of various sultans and the policies they had and how they affected the people who lived in Delhi. And we're talking now about their descendants rising up and like becoming essentially so nativized that they rise up against this, this Central Asian conqueror. Leave aside the fact that many of their ancestors were actually Central Asian conquerors. Um, they're rising up against him. And in return for this are just brutally and horrifically slaughtered. I mean... The last point, especially that you brought up, was was so interesting, Aditya, because 
You mentioned that Timur goes out of his way to select architects and artists and artisans and take them back to his capital because Timur is is an absolutely savage man. There is there is no way around that. He's a brutal and horrific person and probably a deeply unpleasant individual to be around. But he's also a man of extraordinary vision. He understands that in order to bind together all these disparate peoples that he rules over, especially all these disparate and relatively, quote-unquote, democratic and egalitarian Central Asian tribes, he needs to overawe them with magnificent cultural displays and with a magnificent imposing architecture. He is not some kind of barbarian, right? That to me is, is what is most interesting about Timur and his descendants is that for all the violence and ruthlessness that they are capable of, they are extraordinarily cultured people. And it also kind of fits in with what you were saying a little earlier about how they live at the crossroads of many civilizations. Ideas are constantly coursing through their lands. And they're, this is very clearly reflected in their art, in their culture, um, and especially in their courtly culture. These, these people are not some kind of backward savages who just want to destroy everything. They are also builders. They are also aestheticians. They are remarkably sophisticated people representing among the most extraordinary cultural developments of the Islamic world and more broadly, a global history as well. Yeah, Anirudh, you know, as a longtime resident of Delhi, I will say that uh, I have walked by the that flat area on which this uh, specific battle took place, always wondered about it. You know, this is basically the place that was later Willingdon Aerodrome and, uh, you know, Subdajing Airport. It's it's where the Commonwealth Games parking lot is. You know, it's, it's basically what's near Subdajang tomb, which is a much later 18th century monument. And I will admit that my bias is that I'm not the greatest fan of Timur. But I really do have a great deal of respect for and I'm fascinated by his army. I'm fascinated by his career. Because like you pointed out, this was not just some mindless barbarian. This was actually a very clever man. He may have made mistakes. He may have been impetuous. He may have been deeply unpleasant, but stupid he was not. And one of the things that he did actually in his career throughout was to encourage art and architecture, but also thought. He was interested in learning about philosophy. He was interested in theology. So this is an intellectually curious man, even if he was also a terribly violent man. And you do see both of those aspects uh, prop up really barely about a year after he leaves India. In 1400, Timur decides, well, uh, enough peace, it's time to go and kill people again. And he decides to attack the Mamluk sultans of Egypt. And so he enters what is today Syria at Aleppo, uh, a city we've all heard of in recent times. He basically massacres people, erects a tower of skulls of apparently at least 20,000 people. He defeats a Mamluk army outside Damascus and uh, besieges the city. And it is at this time that he meets a man who we now know as Ibn Khaldun. Who is Ibn Khaldun? Well, you know, some people call him a philosopher, a historian. In some ways, he's really an early sociologist. But the key idea for which Ibn Khaldun is known for is, is the idea of the Asabiya. What is the Asabiya? It's basically, it's a term that tries to get at what is the underlying social cohesion in a society. So Ibn Khaldun's key argument was that if you, for example, looked at the Bedouin, the nomadic Bedouins of uh, Arabia, he argued that the reason why they were able to create these large empires is because they had a great deal of social cohesion. They were a small, closely knit group. Many people were related to each other. Their common bonds were very strong. And uh, this allowed them to expand their power. And his argument was that uh, once you expand your power, your social group grows, you know, those ties, those bonds start to loosen. And that cohesion is not what it was. And eventually you are overwhelmed by another society which has a greater asabiya. This is almost like a cyclical idea of history. You know, it's the idea that, you know, of, of empires rising and empires falling, of empires having a certain character which enables them to actually grow. And it is an, that very same growth that destroys or dilutes that original character and allows somebody else to come and take over. Uh, one of the things that Ibn Khaldun was trying to explain at this time was, of course, the massive Mongol invasions of the Middle East. This had, these had been catastrophic. You know, at the same time that the Delhi Sultanate was effectively fending off the Mongols in India, the Mongols were actually wreaking havoc all across the Middle East. You know, when something catastrophic like that happens, people look for explanations. And this was really at the heart of Ibn Khaldun's explanation for why this massive historical phenomenon happened. But I think it's this, this is useful not just 
to explain, say, the Mongol expansion. But his ideas, maybe, you know, if if we were to apply it uh, to our modern understanding of geopolitics, can help us understand, for example, why these things kept happening in India. Why did we see this eruption of Turkic peoples coming into India? Why did we see Timur's armies coming into India? And why later Babur? Is there a reason for it? Or is there something, or is it just one thing and after the other? Now, you could potentially explain this by using Asabiya in its most narrow form, which is the idea that, well, uh, you know, these people chose to enter India at a time, at times when local kingdoms were fairly weak and divided, where As- Asabiya was low. And, and so they were able to gain a foothold. And there's probably some truth in that. If you look at them, simply most of the successful invasions of India occur at times of uh, division, of times of general chaos uh, in India. But I, there's more to it. I think it's really important for us to understand as we set the stage that India was not unique. While India experienced uh, incursions of Turkic peoples, Mongol peoples, you know, so did most of the Middle East, including the Iranian plateau, so did the Anatolian plateau, what we now call the country of Turkey. India was not exactly unique in this. It was actually part of a broader phenomenon. And what could that phenomenon be? Modern geographers, historians have tried to understand this. And the most common theory, and I think the one that has the best validity here, is the idea of the arid zone and the semi-arid zone. If you were to actually look at a map of what is what we would call Eurasia and North Africa, uh, you know, this is basically the what the Greeks would call the oikumene or the inhabited zone. So really, we're looking at the landmass that stretches all the way from Northwest Africa on the Atlantic coast uh, all the way to China and Japan. There's almost a hook-shaped or you might say M-shaped zone in which most of Eurasia's or Afro-Eurasia's peoples have lived. These are the zones where you see both a nomadic peoples and, of course, settled peoples. And over here, what you will find is that there is a remarkably contiguous arid or semi-arid zone. So this extends from, of course, the North African deserts, through the Arabian Peninsula, through Iranian plateau. And in the north, you see a whole lower portion of the steppes of Central Asia. Now, this also extends into the subcontinent across its westerly zones, uh, what you would call Balochistan, Southern Sin, Gujarat, and all the way down to parts of the western parts of the Deccan Plateau. So you have a arid or semi-arid zone extending really all the way from North Africa to Maharashtra and Karnataka in, in India. So that's a really interesting way of looking at this area because, you know, for a nomadic or semi-nomadic army, this Ecology matters a great deal because this is basically an area in which a horse-heavy army can expand. And this probably goes some way in explaining India's experience uh, with nomadic peoples. And India is an especially interesting case because all of the rest of India is actually highly productive agricultural zone. So India is one of those parts of the world where you have a semi-arid zone entering into the subcontinent and it interfaces with highly productive, highly fertile zones in which, you know, wealthy, prosperous empires and kingdoms of all sorts grow. To my mind, that is a really compelling explanation, a long-term 30,000 feet above the air explanation for why India has often seen these incursions of nomadic peoples. That's such an interesting idea that, as you said, like looking at history from this kind of 30,000 feet above angle reveal some really extraordinary patterns. And, and what what I find so fascinating is that this pattern really holds true across enormous expanses of time. If you were to look at the, the situation about 1400 years before Timur to when you already, when you have another eruption of Central Asian peoples, including, for example, uh, the Shakas and the Kushanas, I don't think it's a coincidence that they actually set up kingdoms very much within the semi-arid zone. Um, so the Shakas, for example, who are based around Gujarat, the indo scythians as they're called, and of course, the Kushanas who are based in Punjab. And while they are interested in expansion, we do see the Kushanas, for example, uh, we see the Kushan king Kanishka claiming to have conducted campaigns as far away as uh, Pataliputra and uh, Tamralitri in Bengal. These are obviously meant to be kind of subjugating campaigns, you know, to secure loot, that kind of thing. The most substantial Kushan presence in India proper is in Mathura, which is really the gateway that they're using to control this highly productive agricultural zone, not necessarily expanding into it themselves. Of course, the Delhi Sultanate is 
a little different in the sense that you know, though they originate in the semi-arid zone um, and they're based in Delhi, which is kind of the crossroads between the semi-arid zone and the productive zone, they also managed to build up this extraordinary administrative apparatus that extends deeper into the Gangetic Plains and in many ways actually builds on the pre-existing administrative structures that Indian states and dynasties had kind of figured out in the centuries before that. But that's something that hopefully we'll get to later in this podcast. The other thing that I found very interesting was the way you talked about Ibn Khaldun, right? We are talk- we're looking at this guy who in, in the 14th, early 15th century is sitting and coming up with these explanations for um, these vast historical trends that do not require him to rely on any sort of religious explanations. Um, And given the kind of Islamophobic discourse, if I can use that term, given the kind of Islamophobic stereotypes that have really gained a lot of ground over the last few years, this idea that Muslims across time and space were united by this fanatical idea of um, holy war, jihad, and saw that as the only determinant of their history, Ibn Khaldun like really flies in the face of all that, right? As does Timur himself. On the one hand, he claims to be a holy warrior, he claims to be a Ghazi and so on. But as you pointed out, his actions show that he's not interested in actually any of that sort of thing. Uh, he's only interested in using that to justify his own much more calculated geopolitical machinations. And Ibn Khaldun's explanation of these kind of macro-historical trends also show us that the Islamic world of the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries was really extraordinarily sophisticated. And like also extraordinarily rational um, and scientific in ways that, that seem quite familiar to us today. So that's a really interesting example. And while we're on the subject of talking about things from this kind of a 30,000 feet above view, um, let's try to do a general survey of the world in this time and try to understand what were the big and really interesting things that were happening. For all of Ibn Khaldun's interesting ideas of Asabia and so on, um, it was really in a much more fragmented and divided part of the world that we see some of the most interesting technological trends of the time emerging. And that is Europe. Now, one thing that Europe had begun to really experiment with this kind of military tactic called the pike and shot formation. Um, Now, how pike and shot basically works is that you force the enemy to come to you. You develop these kind of missile capabilities either by using uh, trained archers or crossbowmen to inflict punishing casualties on them when they are at a distance, which forces them to try and get closer and closer. And then once they're closer, they are kept away from the archers by usually dismounted cavalrymen, pikemen, or these long spears that kind of keep them at bay and allow your archers to keep hammering them until they're forced to retreat, at which point you can go after them and defeat them piecemeal. This is something that the English actually deployed to an extraordinary effect in the Battle of Agincourt in the 15th century. And over the next century or so, um, really leading up to kind of climactic 16th century, where we see a lot of extraordinary technical developments, what happens is that across Europe, you see pike and shot formations becoming more and more effective. One big reason for this, of course, is the fact that Europeans are also innovating technologically. Gunpowder is something that that arrived in Europe uh, as a result of innovations in China and was then kind of transmitted through Eurasia by the Mongols. And what happens is that the Europeans are able to figure out more effective ways of manufacturing the raw materials of gunpowder, including, for example, saltpeter. And they're also able to figure out this method called corning, uh, which which creates these large grains of gunpowder which don't get wet as easily um, and also burn more evenly and with a kind of with a, and generate more heat, uh, which means that they can propel projectiles further and further. So there's really this kind of a revolution that happens in European small arms. And given the fragmented political state of Europe, um, especially in Germany and Italy, for example, where you basically have citizen militias who are forced to defend themselves against other citizen militias, as well as much more powerful states, you see gunpowder and kind of handguns um, being used at wider and wider scales to inflict really punishing casualties on enemies at a distance. Now, all these innovations are kind of brought together by this uh, Spanish general called Gonzalo de Cordova, who is really transformative figure in uh, military history more generally because he innovates this uh, remarkable formation called the Tercio. And how the Tercio works is really um, the most effective deployment of the pike and shot tactic that we have ever seen up to this point. You essentially have these large blocks of pikemen with very, very long pikes who are deployed along with arquebusiers, hand gunners, musketeers more broadly. Um, And how these guys work is that uh, is the general tactic that I outlined before. 
they get into a really strong defensive position. The arquebusiers and so on usually get into wagons, that kind of thing. So they're able to command the center of the battlefield. And they basically hammer at the enemy until the enemy comes closer and closer. And at which point the pikemen engage and like keep them at bay until they're totally and absolutely shattered. These are all very important things. The idea that you can use these kind of portable mobile barriers uh, like wagons and so on to keep your infantry in, not just for keeping the enemy at bay, but also for um, hammering them and inflicting damage at a distance. And finally, that cavalry are kind of relegated from where they used to be in the center of the European battlefield with you know the, with these great knightly and knightly hosts to moving on the flanks and being more uh, light and mobile kinds of forces that could encircle the enemy and break them down as they were as they were trying to flee from you these are all very very important innovations and we will see in um, in a few minutes or so how these were all really brought to the fore by by Babur. but before we get to Babur, let's let's kind of move further to the east again maintaining this kind of a 30000 feet overview of everything that's happening try to understand perhaps um, what's happening in central asia what did timur really do to change the military balance and the military tactics that are being used in central asia what's really interesting about timur army is both how old it is in 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 the ways it in which it operates and how and and also how new it is in some ways so you know at the most basic all of these steppy armies had some common characteristics and you don't need to just look back at the 14th or the 15th century for this you can go back you know a thousand years before that and you'd see for example the indo uh doing broadly similar things. So whether you were a Scythian, whether you're a Mongol or you were a Turk, you would your armies would be largely dominated by cavalry. The cavalry would broadly be of two types. You would have either mounted archers or you would have heavy shock cavalry. So the mounted archers carry small composite bows, basically packed a lot of punch in a fairly small package. And so could be used very effectively from horseback. These were people who were basically born and raised on horseback, uh, were very comfortable on their horses in a way that not always settled people, in a way that perhaps not all settled peoples were. The combination of shot, of standoff capability as embodied by the horse archers and shock capability as embodied by the heavy cavalry was actually a fairly deadly combination. So, you know, in the vast expanses of the steppes, for example, you know, you needed to spot your enemy, you needed to go out, look for them, you needed to fix them. They, you know, this was a land where misdirection, where deception, surprise were everything. And uh, so you essentially end up having armies that have a very sophisticated sort of field craft. Remember, this field craft of fighting is very deeply connected to the, their way of living. It's uh, directly connected to herding animals. It's directly connected to moving as, as a group of nomads from one pasture land to another. And so, you know, it Warfare is directly a product of their society. It's directly integrated in, into their whole way of living. And this is a world in which, for example, unlike in most settled societies, leadership tends to be fairly egalitarian. And it's generally unlikely that you become a leader of any note without merit. So most people who are leaders got there, perhaps partly through the hereditary process, but they wouldn't actually end up being leaders unless they were really capable of commanding, they were really capable of getting rid of their enemies and were also capable of expanding the power of a tribe, giving them greater access to resources and so on. These were also societies in which every male was essentially a fighter. You know, what we would today call citizen soldiers. Conscription was was always on. There was always conscription in these uh, nomadic armies in the, at their most classic, basic sense. Every adult male had to be ready to mount a horse and wield either some sort of shock weapon like a lance or a sword or more often a bow and uh, a sheaf of arrows. So this is a world that is designed for mobility, for striking hard, for deception, and for being able to surprise enemies and get around them in ways that are disconcerting. And uh, this is, this to a great deal explains the expansion of nomadic peoples, the fact that so many empires, whether in the Middle East, in Northern India, in the Anatolian plateau, were often of nomadic origin. 
the explanation is actually fairly straightforward. These settled societies were often met by these nomadic societies that had a greater military power. Now, what is also interesting, like we said, is that these are societies the, that basically straddle the trade routes between major civilizations and so had direct access to all the latest, greatest technologies. This is evident, for example, in Timur's armies, which, for example, were very good at constructing siege engines. And you, know, you can see this with lots of other nomadic empires, including... For example, the nomad descended empires of the Delhi Sultanate. You know, these were empires that had access to war horses, that had access to siege technologies. And, and what's also interesting about Timur's army, you know, the new part is that you do start to see a larger proportion of the army consisting of infantry. Anirudh, you talked about the so-called infantry revolution in Europe, you know, where you suddenly started seeing the rise of these heavy infantry formations that were able to ward off uh, the heavy cavalry that had dominated European warfare for centuries. What you see in Timur's army is not quite heavy infantry, but you start to seeing, really for social reasons, this army does not necessarily have the sheer quantity of cavalry that it needs. And so it starts recruiting people from the mountains, it starts recruiting people from settled areas who often fight on foot. And so you start to see these uh, hybrid armies developing even in places like Samarkand. So that's that's the new part. And, uh, you know, infantry are very useful, for example, for fighting in mountains, for conducting sieges. And it's interesting to see the idea of these sort of hybrid armies existing, not just, for example, in places like India, but also in Central Asia. This is so fascinating. It's it's also interesting to me that you pointed out just how, quote-unquote, meritocratic a lot of these Central Asian armies were, right? There was little, if any, room for you consistently messing up as a leader without learning for your, from your mistakes. These are essentially proving grounds that are absolutely violent. There is little to no room for any sort of laziness in terms of adopting innovations and that kind of thing. And it's very interesting also that we, we see... Uh, a lot of things that we associate with modern armies kind of emerging really in Central Asia, right? It's by far Central Asia has the most effective armies of, of this time. They have, uh, you know, for example, um, standardized unit sizes. They have uniforms. They have a intelligence communication services. And of course, as you pointed out, uh, they have siege engineers. So they're extremely innovative, extremely mobile, extremely flexible armies that are capable of adapting to almost any kind of terrain, almost any kind of enemy, uh, and actually doing a pretty good job. And not just a pretty good job, but actually really dominating them. Many of the great polities of the medieval world were really kind of swept aside by this eruption of nomadic peoples that we uh, talked about in the last episode and that we're actually seeing continuing under Timur in this episode. This also kind of brings up some more questions, right? Aditya mentioned India, for example, uh, where hybrid armies were already being used in some form, especially by uh, the Delhi sultans, because they had access to far more infantry than they had access to cavalry. But we also know that in the Deccan Sultanates, we were seeing um, some really extraordinary military revolutions. And probably in the 16th, in the in the 15th and 16th centuries, um, it was the Deccan more than any other part of India that was really leading um, in terms of military innovations. Um, we saw, for example, that Alfonso the Albuquerque, the Portuguese viceroy of Goa, once wrote a letter to his uh, ruler, Manuel I of Portugal, saying that Bijapuri gunsmiths, whom he found in Goa, could manufacture stuff that was easily on par with what was being made in Germany and Bohemia. And why Germany and Bohemia? This is very interesting because I talked a little earlier about how German citizen militias were really innovating in terms of using kind of handguns to keep enemies at bay while working in, in, in coordination with infantry to kind of dismantle much larger armies. Um, and I feel like all of these are really brought to a peak in the Battle of Talikota, which we ended the last season with. The Battle of Talikota is still like highly debated. There are all these like really strange narratives about it floating on the internet, despite our best efforts. Um, and we ourselves actually had a few brainwaves about how Talikota might have gone down as we were reading for this season and kind of understanding the broader military trends of the times. And the answer really in, in terms of like how Talikota was fought has been staring us in the face the entire time. We know that uh, an Ottoman engineer called Rumi Khan or a really an artillery expert called Rumi Khan was in charge of the Sultanate Center at the Battle of Talikota. That's very significant because we know how the Ottomans fought because the Ottomans left us far more detailed historical records. And the Ottomans essentially used this highly advanced version of the pike and shot formation that I talked about a little earlier. They didn't necessarily use pikes as much. They tended to instead use wagons to kind of command the center of the battlefield. They would deploy artillery and they would deploy musketeers and arquebusiers in these wagons. And what they would do is that as the enemy was approaching them, they would use cavalry archers to inflict heavy damage, thus forcing the enemy to come closer and closer to try and 
break the Ottoman center. When they reached the center, they would be basically broken to pieces using extremely effective artillery and gunpowder. And then as they were fleeing, you would have cavalry come in and basically clean up. Now, very interestingly, at the Battle of Talikota, we are told that Rumi Khan ordered his cannons to be tied together in three rows uh, with chains. I think, and we also know that at Talikota, that initially when the when the battle started, we had the cavalry on both sides engaging with each other, and we also had the infantry and skirmishers kind of exchanging a few rounds of shots before the battle progressed. At some point in the battle, the Sultanate's infantry kind of retreated. We're not really clear how, um, leaving the Sultanate cannons a clear line of fire into the Vijayanagara center. Now, all of this seems a little weird, right? But once you understand within the context of Ottoman warfare, because Rumi Khan literally means the the Roman Khan, uh, and the Romans is what the Ottomans called themselves at this time. And uh, Rumi Khan clearly was using Ottoman military tactics. He had wagons chained together. In these wagons, he deployed skirmishers and cannons. And the infantry were used to screen the cannons. So the Vijnagara side did not really know how effective the Sultanate artillery was. Once the Vijnagara side was overconfident, the Sultanate infantry seems to have retreated between the wagons. And once they had retreated, the chains between the wagons were lifted again to make sure that, you know, Vijayanagara cavalry could not get through. And then the Vijayanagara infantry tried to advance to kind of bring a decisive close to the battle, at which point they were kind of blown apart by by extremely effective artillery. Um, and the sides, and they were prevented from flanking the, the Sultanate center by cavalry and probably elephants as well. All of this like really makes a lot of sense. And it's also like extremely impressive because it shows you that the Deccan once again really was pushing the limits of what was possible in the time in terms of using the most extraordinary military innovations. Yeah, Anirad, you know, the more that we have thought about the Battle of Talikota, the more we we realize how much, how little we know about it. And because our sources for the battle are so fragmentary, it's hard for us to try and assemble what happened. And so we have to rely on educated guesses. But I think that the best educated guess is really the one that you've come up with. The wagon lagar of some sort uh, is really the most effective explanation for the success of the Sultanate coalition that was fighting Vijayanagara. I should point out that this this sort of lagar of wagons was not something new. It seems to be this idea that was coursing around a large chunk of Europe and perhaps also Central Asia for a while. Alluded to some of the field fortifications that uh, Timur Lenk erected in Delhi in the plains outside the city. Now, some of the clearest evidence that we have for wagon lagars or, you know, uh, circles of wagons comes from uh, late medieval times in, East, in Eastern Europe, in Eastern and Central Europe, especially with the Hussites. And what you start seeing is especially infantry, setting up these sort of mobile defensive fortifications using these circles or squares of wagons that are tied together, secured together, usually with oxhide or or some some other strong material, perhaps with metal chains. And uh, this basically gives them protection against cavalry. So it's very hard for cavalry to come and smash into you when, when you have this sort of field fortification protecting you. And you definitely see the Ottomans picking this up from wherever they picked it up. Again, a lot of this is, is is really maddeningly unclear to us. But the Ottomans did pick it up and they have and they used it very effectively. We have lots of records of them using it. And what this allowed armies to do was basically to move offensively and fight defensively. So you you could get to somewhere, force an enemy to attack you uh, and fight defensively. Uh, and when the enemy was uh, routed or when the enemy was in disarray and at a moment of confusion or weakness, you would strike usually from the flanks and attack the enemy and turn it into basically a complete rout. You even see something along these lines, for example, in the Battle of Agincourt, Anirudh, which you mentioned. So again, at that time, there were no wagon loggers, but here was again a small expeditionary force moving offensively into French territory, uh, but fighting defensively and uh, basically routing a much larger French host. This is all really interesting to us because when we go back and look at uh, specifically the character of Babur, the great-great-grandson of Timur Elenk, trying to understand his military career really gives us insights into not just him as a general or a commander who's learning how to fight in new ways, but also perhaps something about his character. We had mentioned how to be a leader, a successful leader of any sort in Central Asia meant you needed to 
really deserve that job. Of course, it meant that you wouldn't be a nice person, it, but it would mean that you would be charismatic, that you would be highly capable, that you could get people to work with you. You could create networks of patronage, deliver a credible promise of basically loot or spoils, and basically get a lot of people onto your side uh, to build armies, to build societies. And uh, what's really fascinating to me is how Babur embodies not just all of these characteristics, but he, you know, he combines it with being this highly educated, highly refined person that uh, we had alluded to earlier. You know, this is a man who was educated from the time he was a kid. He learns the Quran, he learns calligraphy, he, he learns poetry. He's able to express himself in, in ways that are artistic. These things were expected of a leader of any sort at this time. Uh, and, you know, Babur was, he was not a sultan. He was not a caliph for sure. He was just a simple mirza. He was really a, a local or regional leader of sorts. And But even in that position, even as a small time and, you know, to some extent, fairly itinerant leader whose base of operations kept shifting, had to have a core of followers around him and had to be able to get more followers whenever, for example, he had to wage war against his enemies. And getting specifically to his army, we talked about how you start seeing some infantry being present in the armies of Timur. Uh, this is far more evident by the time you come to Babur. This is, these are armies that by the time Babur is even in his early 20s, he is doing what we talked about earlier. He's fighting defensively. So, and, and how do you fight defensively? It means the center of your line is largely composed of infantry. Now, one thing that Babur and his armies didn't quite have access to is something like the tercios. You, you did not have dense squares of men wielding large pikes. There could be cultural or social reasons for this, but it's very easy for us to point out a simple tactical reason, which is that uh, these were environs in which horse archers dominated. If you created a dense body of infantry that had very limited ability to defend itself from missiles, they were instantly vulnerable. Now, on a European battlefield, typically you did not have that sort of horse archery. What you would have is either cavalry that could throw javelins or in later times, uh, cavalry that wielded wheel lock pistols, which, you know, are a very effective at a short range, that pistol ball would contain much greater kinetic energy than an arrow ever could. But its range was really short, so its momentum was would dip very slow, very quickly. These were weapons of very limited range, and uh, you could fight them off, typically by having screens of, of your own soldiers wielding matchlock muskets. Barber did not quite have that luxury. Horse archers can uh, flight their arrows. While that's less effective, it does give them greater range. But even when they're losing arrows at a fairly flat trajectory, they could easily do so from about 100 yards, 100 meters. So, you know, they would easily outrange the firearms of that time. And that meant that heavy, dense, concentrated groups of pikemen or other types of infantry were not really practical. So what did you, what did you have to do? We can see an evolution in Barber's methods as he learns to adapt the wagon lagar, the so-called Roman method. Did he learn this from the Ottomans? Most likely, but it's also possible that the ideas of a wagon lagar was something that was had always been there in Central Asia and that had perhaps been invented and reinvented multiple times. Anirudh, in a preparation for this episode, you and I discussed the Battle of Adrianople, which took place in modern Edirne in Turkey uh, in 378 AD, uh, 1200 years before the events we're talking about, where again you had uh, basically the Romans' enemies, the Goths, using a wagon lagar of some sort as a defensive position. Now, the way they used it might have been very different from, say, Babur, but it does suggest that this was a very durable tactical idea that perhaps kept you know going in and out of fashion. This is all so fascinating, Aditya, especially this explanation you've provided of like how the, the unique kind of military pressures, which are found only in Central Asia, kind of encourages a much more innovative approach to the problem of keeping your infantry defended while also forcing the enemy to come at you, right? But before we kind of like get into that a little further, I want to talk more about Babur as a person. You talked about how he's a highly educated guy that's kind of demanded by the culture of his times, but just how educated. Babur is born as the principality called Fergana, 
while growing up, he studied Persian classics. He was tutored by a cleric who was a Najbandi Sufi. And later on, um, after his father's death and various entanglements with the politics of his other Timurid uncles, he ended up in control of Samarkand, though it didn't last for very long. And while he was in Samarkand, he uh, learned a lot about Greco-Islamic astronomical research, which was pioneered by Timur's grandson, Uluq Beg. And he also picked up like, quite an appreciation for Samarkand's extraordinary gardens. So um, if you read the Babur Nama, which is a really unique autobiographical text, we have nothing like it really from the early modern period. Um, you see that Babur is constantly going on about gardens, like to the point where it gets really annoying at times. He just waxes lyrical about how beautiful gardens are and he really appreciates nature and so on and so forth. And he also is very interested in architecture. So he's he's very, very impressed and very, very moved um, really by the architecture of Samarkand. And he has this um, a very unique kind of cultural position where his main thing in life is that he wants to hang out with his friends in a beautiful garden and he wants to indulge himself in the pleasures of a refined discourse and, of course, in the pleasures of wine and drugs. Very interestingly, one of the most remarkable portraits of Babur that has survived to us today shows him wearing this very fashionable turban, dressed in this beautifully decorated red robe made from very expensive materials. And his face doesn't look anything like this bronze eight-pack ab guy with a thick beard, you know, ordering people to go on holy war and kill infidels that we generally associate with in popular culture. Instead, his face is kind of soft. He has um, this very wispy kind of mustache, a very wispy kind of beard. He's got these beautiful almond-shaped eyes and he's looking at a book. He's holding a book in both hands and he's evidently uh, deeply engrossed in reading it and he's surrounded by nature and he's having a really great time just doing that. So he's really a very complex individual. He is both uh, a remarkable military leader who is capable of all these innovations that Aditya was pointing out in terms of like adopting stuff from the rest of the world. But this is this really dates from a later part of his career, right? What Aditya was talking about is what Babur was up to in 1510, 1514 or so. But he was actually, if you look at him earlier in his career, when he's just a highly educated Timurid prince, you see that he is by no means a very mature military leader. And in fact, the punishing kind of political and military environment of Central Asia um, very rapidly teaches him the errors of his ways. Yeah, I think the best example of Babur getting punished for his mistakes in that, you know, ruthless cutthroat world, an incident when he's fighting the Uzbegs, uh, the Uzbek chieftain, especially Shaibani Khan. And there's an incident in 1501. Remember, 1501 meant that at this time, Babur was an 18-year-old. So this 18-year-old guy is leading an army and he makes a terrible mistake. He gets out of his defensive position where he has a series of ditches and other field fortifications protecting his army. And he goes out to try and fight a battle uh, with his back to a river. And what immediately happens is something that we see in Central Asian warfare a lot of times. You see the Uzbeks basically attacking his left flank, their right. And they're able to probe into this and uh, basically create a, a gap in his lines and uh, immediately rout his army. And this is something that it's a sort of disaster that Babur had to learn from. It was while he survived this, while he got away, while some of his army got away, he knew that he could not afford mistakes like this. And one thing that I think we do see is that Babur is never again in his life so rash about getting out of a field fortification. And, you know, that's probably part of his strengths as a general. It could have also perhaps even ended up being a limitation, but it was something that he definitely learned. Now, the other thing, you know, he talked about how Babur is not just this imperfect person who's constantly trying to learn. He's also this highly cultured person who has an open mind, right? I'm always, you know, reading the Babur Nama is both frustrating and often, you know, sometimes entertaining because it, <laughs> this is quite a messed up person, right? In many ways. But one of the things that this messed up, ruthless, cruel, brilliant person does is that he starts adapting the new technologies that he has access to at this time. And uh, the new technologies are, of course, firearms, specifically cannons and muskets. And then the crucial point over here to learn is that by this time, there had been a major development in cannon manufacture. So, for example, the cannons that Afonso de Albuquerque found in Goa in 1510 or 1511 were definitely of high quality, but they were probably made out of segments of iron bands that were bound together. What had started happening at exactly that same time was that you started seeing bronze cannons come. Now, you know, these bronze cannons would also eventually become obsolete as a new type of iron cannon would later replace them several centuries later. But at this time, 
bronze cannons were fairly cutting edge. And the challenge over here was how do you cast them? Now, it looks like everybody came up with slightly different solutions. Uh, so, for example, we do know that Europeans figured out how to do bronze cannon casting by basically using the same technology with which they cast their church bells. And uh, this basically allowed them to create cannons that uh, could take larger balls in them. So, so basically, you could shoot further with these cannons. And you do see evidence of this in Europe and of this technology being put to use, for example, in when the French king Charles VIII uh, invaded the Italian peninsula in 1494 and basically sweeps across fortifications uh, all, all over those lands. And, you know, it's one of those uh, shocking events that basically upset the balance of power in Europe. And it seems very likely that Barber was able to also have access to this technology that that he or engineers in his army knew how to cast bronze cannons and uh, were able to use them both for sieges and from fortified positions during battle. The other technology that Barber had access to was, of course, muskets. Now, uh, Anilu has gone into this in some detail, but, you know, just to give you a broader picture, you know, you couldn't simply carry one of those huge matchlock muskets like you would if, say, you were in, one, in Napoleon's armies. You would basically ground a fork, almost like a bipod or a tripod, into the ground and rest one part of this uh, heavy musket on it. And, of course, these were matchlocks, so you would actually literally have to light a match to set off the charge inside these muskets. So these were very clumsy weapons. It required considerable training, at least for a few weeks or months, to learn how to use them. And it wasn't really practical to use them if you were not in a fortified position. But Baba's armies had learned to use cannons, they'd learned to use muskets, and they were already well adept in using field fortifications. And all of these would come together to create the army that would later forge an empire. Join us in the next episode of Yuddha to witness Babur's armies at their finest. Witness Babur's climactic battles at Panipat and Kanwa and see how this extraordinary individual from the cruel, blood-soaked and refined courts of Central Asia brought some of the most extraordinary military technology to Northern India's plains and totally transformed within the space of just a few years. India's military history is fascinating, horrifying, and spellbinding. It is also misunderstood. Historical figures did not live, kill, and die in order to conform to our political beliefs. And military history is not just a series of battles. It's a way of looking at our past. And the lens of military history is dark, but it is also illuminating, revealing the political, social, cultural, and economic forces that shape the subcontinent. If you agree and would like to help more people understand India the way we see it, the best thing you can do to support us is to leave us a review and tell others about this podcast. And while you're at it, please support the IBM Podcast Network as well by listening to Yuddha, Echoes of India, All Things Policy, and other shows on the IBM Podcasts app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On this round is on me, Shelly Chopra shares with Gauri how they hit $750 million on She The People TV. We have a new show, The Last Brand Standing. Anupam Gupta and Ambi Parmeshwar get together and discuss some of the biggest and most public feuds in Indian brand history. Do check that out. Taste the lip-smacking palate of Karachi with Bilal Hassan on Naan Curry with Sadaf and Archit. On Misconduct, learn all about Dawood Ibrahim's sister, Hasina Parker with Ragvi and Nisha. Is the Indian constitution queer friendly? Find out on the longest constitution podcast with Priya Mirza. And on Audio Gyan, Harish S., design head at Cred, talks about his Carnatic rock band and design as an art form. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any other show for that matter, please do tell a friend. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors on the network this week, Siet, Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, CoinSwitch, Kuber, and Intuit India. Thank you so much for making this possible. Namaste, this is Cyrus Brocha. I am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available. So what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show. It's called Cyrus Says. It's on IVM Podcast. You have to watch it and listen to it. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. There are many different ways. Don't bother me and ask me how. Uh, you have to find out.
we talk to different personalities many of them are known some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai but the point is it's fun and it's very therapeutic so please join in and listen to Cyrus Sess 